Welcome to Sustainability Now, an exploration of technologies and paradigms to shape a world that works. Designed for socially conscious entrepreneurs and individuals interested in responsible stewardship of the planet. Sustainability Now covers food, energy, housing, water, waste, health, economics, and consciousness. Welcome to your community, Sustainability Now, with your host, Mira Rubin. Welcome, everybody, to Sustainability Now, Technologies and Paradigms to Shape a World that Works. I'm your host, Mira Rubin, and you are in for a treat today. We have a triple header with Donovan Spitzman, Lisa Bodie, and Nick Navarez here to talk about the unique Crestone community in Crestone, Colorado, and the 30th anniversary of the Crestone Energy Fair, which happens to be the longest running sustainability fair in the nation. And um, this year's fair is gonna be held from August 16th through the 18th. And it's gonna focus on the physical skills necessary to uh, build sustainably and uh, energy it creates sustainable energy generation and also on the emotional and spiritual skills um, that are required because we know that this is a holistic thing that sustainability doesn't exist without self-care and mindset and um, that's going to be supported with workshops and disciplines that teach and promote health wellness and relationship building so i am so excited to have you guys here um we for those of you that are listening uh we just connected and it's kind of a meeting of the minds because this Crestone community and the Crestone Energy Fair is doing a lot of what the Sustainability Now Telesummit was all about. And you guys not only are doing it this year, but you've been doing it for 30 years. And so you have a whole lot to share with all of us. And um, I'm just really glad to have you here. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having us. It's awesome. So how about if we start by um, having you guys introduce yourselves in, you know, give a little bit of an idea of what you're bringing to the Crestone Energy Fair, because you, you are a triumvirate. You bring uh, very much complementary skills that are creating a, a whole that's even greater than the sum of the parts. So how about if you fill us in on that, and then we'll get a sense of the dynamic, and then we can jump off from there. Sounds good. Cool. Cool. Go so. for it. Okay. <laughs> Well, hi, hello everyone. Thank you so much, Mira. This is such a pleasure. And my name's Lisa Bodie, and I am the director of this year's Energy Fair. So it's been a lot of fast tracking of catching up with, um, I've been involved in the past years with our youth program and solar cooking, just volunteering for the event. Stepped in a little deeper last year, and it just really became clear that uh, this was where I was gonna be this summer <laughs> and, and the next year. So I, I'm really coming at looking at the overall, how we're working together as a community. So all of our committees, all of the people that are involved in um, helping with this production. So coordinating that meeting aspect, and then it's a lot of relationship building too. So with some restorative practices, um, really making sure voices are heard and that we're collaborating in a new way. We're really trying to incorporate um, empowering the community to be part of this event. Everyone has a skill set or a resource to contribute, so how do we get them engaged in the overall event? And as I've said before, I meant I'm damage control. <laughs> and yet, well, you have also a, a very strong skill set in social justice and, and building, uh, building bridges right in community is that true you know it's it's happening naturally i think having worked with youth and then partnering them with elders in the community in the past through workforces that creates that intergenerational relationship and that bridges a lot of gaps in, and especially in a small community um you know as we have an aging population how are those youth helping and then a few years ago, I was fortunate to study with Sylvia Clute. She's in Richmond, Virginia with um, Unit of Justice. 
And that's led to other trainings in our valley and most recently the National Restorative Justice Training in Denver, which was phenomenal. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I think that that's such a critical piece in um, looking at where we're headed in, uh, at this time in history where we really need to find ways to build bridges. And mm-hmm. so I think that that's an essential piece in sustainability. So thank you for, for what you do. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Who's next? <laughs> I'll jump in. Okay. So I'm Don Spitzman. And... Um, I got involved in this several years ago. I think it's about seven or eight now, seven maybe, involved in volunteering to help organize the energy fair for Crestone. And um, it all came to about from a passion for passive solar design that I came about, boy, a couple of decades ago. Started doing some research on passive solar design and earthen construction, alternative building materials. And through that research, I found Crestone, which... Um, is kind of the motherland to alternative and off-grid building and earthen building. It's just an incredible display and concentration of all types of building construction methods and energy creation. That's phenomenal. Wonderful. Thank you. And how about you, Nick? Uh, I'm Nick Navaris. I, um, I, my history is in um, live event and festival production. Um, so I bring the organizational aspect to the table. (laughs) Um, so, you know, these guys design plan it, and I produce it. I'm, I'm the on the ground person to make it all happen. Beautiful. So you, you guys are sort of the superpower team all together. You just bring all your, yeah, exactly. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) So, so you mentioned that, uh, Crestone is really kind of a unique, Place. And I think, I think we should start with that because the fair, there's give and take, it sounds like, between the community and the fair and they help sustain each other. Um, but I, I, I want to talk about the community first because it sounds like such an incredibly magical uh, anomaly <laughs> on the planet, actually. <laughs> So, you know, Crestone um, is, is unique in a variety of ways. First of all, it was back in the 1800s, it was a very robust gold mine that, uh, that actually existed here for a number of years. And after an earthquake, the, the, mine, the mining stopped because they couldn't find the gold anymore. So it's up here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then um, fast forward to the 60s and 70s, there were only about 20 or 30 people living here. Um, and a, a real estate developer came here, realized how stunning it really was up here and decided to create an entire um, community uh, designed actually for retired military personnel. Um, That ended up going bankrupt in the eighties and the wife of the developer ended up um, purchasing the remaining uh, land and doles it out currently in hundred acre parcels to religious organizations um, that exist now up here in the mountains. There are about 20 to 30 of them. That exists, that exists up here. So like, you know, um, a whole bunch of Buddhist stupas that these ricochets come from Tibet every, once a year to uh, work with their group. You have um, a couple of ashrams and a variety of other different sort of very esoteric groups uh, up here in the mountains. And this is for a community of how many people? Uh, it depends on the time of the year. Okay. <laughs> in this, in the summer, it can be upwards of three to four thousand. In the in the winter, when it's you know negative twenty, it can be around fifteen hundred. <laughs> wow. And so there are 20 to 30 different religious organizations in a community of up to about 3,000. That's, that's got to create a unique environment in and of itself without all the alternative building stuff. Mm-hmm. What, how would you characterize the community as a result of, of that kind of crazy um, diversity, amazing diversity, I guess, and, and there's a, simil- a sameness, I guess, that breeds a theme for the community. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. Because there, you've got all these different religious institutions, so there's a religious or spiritual overlay, I would imagine, throughout the whole community, no? Yeah. I, I, I would say it's that, it's that doing that deep inner work. You know, we have a saying here, the mountain's either going to suck you in or spit you out. Mm-hmm. And so you find that a lot of people are coming here on retreat throughout the year to the centers, but then those of us that live here, we have to escape to retreat. (laughs) But 
historically too, the natives would come here for whether it was vision quests um, to bury their dead for specific ceremonies. And, you know, I know Nick mentioned the other day, it's the, called the Bloodless Valley, the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. And so with that, any weapons, uh, any past battles or current conflicts were set aside to come into this space. So it's definitely a place where people are very accepting of that we're all maybe around a lake and that there's different shores though. We might have the same lake, but there's all different shores and different places we can stand to get to that center. So, you know, and another aspect of, of the, the kind of different, um, feeling here is that we sit on top of one of the largest aquifers in North America, which itself then sits on top of a huge bed of quartz crystals. Oh so my there, gosh. there have been studies done here for the frequency that actually exists in these mountains, and they found it to be higher than the frequency that exists in Tibet. Um, oh my so gosh. This is almost like a hidden um, uh, crown chakra of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh, the word is out. <laughs> We have yeah. a lot of mosquitoes right now. Though, so. <laughs> we, we set the bar for mosquito breeding. Yes. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they like the vibration of the crystals. We can't figure out what it is. It's only here, nowhere else in the valley. Yeah, really? Right. That's interesting. Definitely four or five times the population of mosquitoes. Wow. <laughs> That's right. It's going away. That's okay. I like to believe we, it's our diet, and we just have <laughs> great blood. <laughs> So is it, you said the community has been in existence for quite some time. When did the alternative building start there? Wow. I think that started, and I'm going to take a stab in the dark at this one. I believe this started back in the early 80s. Really? Okay. I don't think it went back as far as the late 70s, but the early 80s when the whole um, alternative building movement started catching on, um, Crestone was really, like I said, the homeland to that movement. Kelly Hart was one of the um, probably forefathers of putting that information on the internet and publishing it out into the world and drawing people here specifically for our building code, uh, the building codes and our ability to build this way in our location. Our county has a lack of building codes. So you can really build to your liking in a way that you can't do in a lot of other places. Actually, that's something that's come up quite a lot with all these alternative uh, phenomenal modalities for creating energy efficient uh, environments, local building codes are really an impediment mm -hmm. in so many places. And, and it's, it's retrogressive in so many ways to have those kind of codes, to find a place where you have the freedom to really build according to your, your desires, that's, that's a big deal. And it's very important that we maintain that status yeah. in the country so that we can continue to innovate, knowing that we have some really, um, we have some very strong challenges coming our way as a culture in the country with the way our infrastructure is set up and the way we're utilizing resources. A hundred percent. And we have to have some really innovative functioning models to draw from to rebuild the structure. And, and hopefully what you're doing can help to um, innovate and influence the building codes elsewhere to be That's able fair. to permit this because you have working proof that, yeah. it, that it's viable. So why don't you give us some idea of what kinds of buildings you actually have there? Mm -hmm. Ooh. Wow. Um, what don't we have? That'd be a much shorter list. Well, so um, see, the thing is, people don't know what they don't know. So right, you're gonna yeah. you're gonna name things that people are like, well, what in the world is yeah. that? So some of the things that intrigue me is, um, as of the last few years, we have a, a couple of residents or a few residents now that are getting into the climate battery concept, which is a green attached greenhouse with a slightly different circulation system. Um, for creating heat and storing energy and moisture in soil. Um, and that came from Crimpy up in Basalt, which is, uh, oh gosh, I just forgot the, what Crimpy stands for. Is oh, that with a K or a C? It's a C, C-R-I. Uh, it's permaculture. It's yeah, oh my God, it's a permaculture oh, institute a up, in, up in Basalt. Um, but they're doing some fab fabulous stuff at 9,000 feet harvesting mangoes. Wow. 
Yeah, which is incredibly impressive. <laughs> when we try to grow here in our high alpine desert at 8,000 feet, and you know, if you can get a successful outdoor tomato plant, you're feeling really good about yourself. <laughs> yeah, um, how, how do you spell it so that people can look it up online? D R M P I. Okay. I think it's like Colorado Rocky Mountain Permaculture, Permaculture Institute. Institute. Thank you. That's it. Colorado <laughs> Rocky Mountain Permaculture Institute. Okay, cool. And what's different from that from a an Earthship? Well, so the uh, climate battery actually. So there's two schools of thought. One is you have an attached greenhouse and a passive solar structure that is designed to capture heat. When you capture too much heat, you essentially start venting it. The climate battery takes into consideration that in your greenhouse, you're not only venting heat when you open up those windows, you're also venting out moisture. And so what the climate battery does is it captures that hot air and the moisture in the air, pushes it back down into the root zone of the plants and in the planter beds so that the plants are actually able to recapture the moisture out of the air, but also putting the heat back in so that late at night or deep into the winter, like Nick was mentioning, when it gets 20 below zero and it's actually cold outside, um, you can still maintain a heat generation and you still have your plants for maybe your gray water beds or your aquaponics system is still functioning in those uh, conditions. Beautiful. Yeah. Cool. What, what else do you have? Um, we have cordwood houses. We have several papercrete structures that are homemade papercrete as well as a commercial papercrete. So talk a little bit about that because that's the, something that wasn't even on the summit. It wasn't on my radar even. Papercrete's one of my favorite materials. Years ago, I was part of a uh, bachelor's thesis project that was a study on alternative building. And papercrete actually came out to be probably the best possible material that we could use next to re old car tires. Really? <laughs> and why is that? Well, the product itself is made from uh, post-consumer paper. Okay. And now and we have do to you make, make it from scratch or is it a purchased You material? can make it or you can purchase it. Okay. The challenge, I, I don't encourage people to make it um, unless they're really into being um, uh, very critical about what they're doing. The challenge with paper creep, because there's a lot of um, uh, misinformation out there from people that have done not good uh, steps to making their paper creep and then blame the paper creep for the failure. Mm -hmm. uh, easiest way to explain it is this. If you have a bunch of recycled paper that you're chopping up and turning into a pulp and then you're going to mix a little Portland into it, maybe a little bit of lime and a couple okay. of other things. Um, if your paper mixture varies, what, like say your first batch is all newsprint. Right. Your second batch is all magazines. Your third batch is all construction paper from the school. Those three batches are three totally different products. They won't seal to each other or adhere? They don't always like each other. And okay, that's gotcha. Exactly what happens. And so each one of those batches that has a slight inconsistency in them, suddenly they don't want to bind. Gotcha. Start having failures later on. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. So cool. And what else do you have going on there? Earth ships, <laughs> obviously, one of my favorite things, something that I'm building, uh, Earth ships, which uh, much like the paper creed is a mostly reclaimed post consumer uh, material structure that's earth berm. It uh, collects water, produces heat, makes energy, uh, grows food, and it uh, processes the inhabitants' waste on its own footprint. For everybody that's listening, uh, there is on the sustainabilitynow.global website, there's an interview that we did on Earthship with about Earthships with uh, Amzie Smith and Amy Oskins. So um, you can check out Earthships a little bit more in depth uh, when, with another interview. So cool, what else do you have? Um, obviously the typical straw bale, because that seemed to be where most of the energy went during those early stages of the alternative building movement. So you we say have, typical straw bale, but I don't think that that's very typical for most people <laughs> listening. Doesn't everybody have a straw bale house? <laughs> at least a shed or a dog house. So um, <laughs> tell us about that. Um, so a uh, straw bale is essentially um, a house that's, at, that's built out of bales of straw. And there's several ways to do it. There's a load-bearing straw bale where you actually set the roof on the bales themselves. 
and allow that uh, roof weight to continue to compress the bales over time. There's a, a system where you put a post and beam structure in and then infill with the straw bales. We have the luxury of a straw bale builder around here who's been doing it for a long time and has developed one of uh, kind of a semi-proprietary system that he uses where he's actually compressing the bales as part of the construction process. So instead of allowing the weight of the structure or the bales themselves to settle over the course of time, he actually pre-compresses them based on what they know about the compression of straw bales. His, his structures are one of the only ones that I've seen over, say, five or eight years that doesn't have cracks in the exterior or the, the plaster somewhere. So, so what's the benefit of straw bale building? So straw bale is an incredibly insulatory system to build with. So your straw bale house, when it is done, has an insulatory value of around an R50 on the walls. And so your standard home is usually, usually, usually using an R19 or an R24 bat insulation. Wow. And so they're capping out around 30 or so um, if they're pushing hard. And so your straw bales are coming in. How are the walls? Three feet, 28 to 32 inches. Okay. And so in comparison, the papercrete product has a, an approximate R value of three per inch. And so a 14 inch papercrete wall also has an R value of around 45. Okay, now what about, how do you face the straw bale? You've mentioned plaster. Yeah, there's lots of ways to do it. Um, you can either stucco or depending upon what your personal standards are, uh, clay plasters work really well on them. I've even seen people go so far as to cover the bales um, with a stucco or a, an adobe material and then go back over that and cover it again with some type of a decorative wood or metal accents and mm. set into the adobe. And so really. once it's sealed, you don't have to worry about bugs or anything getting in there and eating all the bales or anything like that? It's an, it definitely, I'm not going to say it's not an issue if it's not done properly because it is. Um, I but can it, imagine, I would imagine it would be. Yeah, and that, again, the straw bale is one of those where I highly recommend a contractor who knows what they're doing because you really want to make sure your foundation, uh, where your foundation marries to the bales, is done properly so that you don't have mold and moisture issues, you don't have rodent issues penetrating those areas. Yeah. Uh, thing with where your roof meets the structure as well. There's some critical points to address in a straw bale specifically. Yeah, this is just reminding me of the story of the three little pigs, <laughs> you know, yeah. all, all these different houses. It's amazing. I want to do a parody. <laughs> I think it would be a great parody. I think it would. I think it would. You can, you can do something with that. <laughs> so um, what else do you have? Let's see, what else do we have? We have some domes, geodesic domes. If you're uh -huh. from Buckminster Fuller. Wow. Um, we have, a, there's at least one pyramid here that is quite amazing. Wow. Lots of um, um, earth bags where they're okay. doing Gothic dome styles and beehive styles. Wow. Uh, we have one person on our home tour this year, Nina, who has a reclaimed grain bin. Uh, house that she made. She reclaimed two grain bins from up in Nebraska, connected them with a solar uh, hallway. Wow. And created mm -hmm. a beautiful structure. So now are these grain bins, they're like silos, no? Silos. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Yep. So it's two stories in them with nine foot ceilings. Amazing. And, uh, yeah. And a beautiful arched ceiling in the, in the top room. Yeah. It's so you mentioned just now the home tour and for everybody listening, you have got to check out this fair because part of the fair is a home tour that includes how many of these homes actually are on the tour where people can see all these different modalities. Uh, it includes a total of 12 homes. Wow. Um, and, and our, um, it's, it's, it's situated over both Saturday and Sunday of the fair. So Saturday includes our finished home tours, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And then, um, and it goes from nine o'clock to noon. And then uh, on Sunday is our unfinished home tours. So you can see the process of building um, different styles of homes, um, you know, and talk to the owner builders themselves. Amazing. Yeah. And this is over what kind of area? How big a distance between these different homes? Oh, they're all within a, a, a large neighborhood area. So, they, you know, they're all accessible within 10 to 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah. So it's walkable or people are driving? Yeah, we, have, we have shuttles that we're going to okay. accommodate people with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll and jump this, in the shuttle and drive you around the Baca. 
<laughs> awesome. Great conversations on that bus. I would imagine they're quite stimulating conversations. <laughs> um, so this is a free event. How do you guys do it? <laughs> well, we want to, we really got our seed money with Swatch County. They are really, they've really made a priority over the years of helping smaller groups and organizations with what's called a sales tax grant. Okay. So apply for, it's usually up to 5,000. I think sometimes it's been a little higher depending on the project. And that's how we've been able, at least this year, to expand. So it's mostly a lot of community support, a lot of private donations. Donovan's been doing a lot with all of our local businesses, radio stations, and getting sponsorship. So we have a GoFundMe. Is that what you say? Well, I was Go say, for it. We are a volunteer run organization. Mm -hmm. So this is all done for the love of the, the organization and the topic. So can you, can you give us the information if there are folks out there that want to volunteer or want to donate or help support you? How do they go about doing that? Yeah, the best place is to go to our website, which is crestoneenergyfair.org. Okay. You'll see a join us. So if you would like to be a presenter, a volunteer, a vendor, and we try to keep those costs really low too. For example, a two-day vendor booth is $30. Wow. Friday, Saturday. So... Um, and then we have our GoFundMe on the bottom of the page and we'll have, we have entertainment and uh, more of our like demonstrations so different sections so you can see. And we're really working to archive the history. We found this is the first year we've had a website. So going back to 1990 when this started um, with the original founder, Kenny Desain, he and his wife, Maggie, are going to be coming up from Mexico this year to celebrate our 30th year with us. Wow. How many people usually come to the fair? It varies. You know, it, it, it can be upwards of like five or upwards of a thousand people. You know, it's, it just, it depends on how much involvement we have with music we have and, and, you know, the different types of demonstrations and the different types of um, speakers we have. You know, this year we've really done a lot of outreach to communities around the country. So, you know, we're actually, this is kind of new ground for us. Um, we're not quite sure what we're going to expect, <laughs> right? but we can accommodate quite a few people um, in the in the footprint that we're that we're using. So um, we'll be able to, you know, we'll be able to work with it. But you know, we're looking forward to hopefully a very robust showing. Mm -hmm. So if folks wanted to come, how how would they get there? I know you we discussed that they would go into Denver, and then it's kind of a pilgrimage to get to you guys, yeah. It is so, kind of a pilgrimage. There are shuttles in a, ver a variety of ways that you can get to us. Uh -huh. Shuttles are probably the easiest way, mountain shuttle. Um, mm -hmm. And if there are people who are wanting to travel in, just connect with us through our mm -hmm. website, and we're happy to help you get from DIA to <clears throat> Crestone. And it's about, it, it would be like a four-hour drive. It's about four hours of travel. Which time. you say is spectacular. <laughs> like it's a, like the most epic drive you will ever take in yeah. the United States. It's amazing. Wow. You know, we should be able to tell the bus driver to stop, stop so you can yeah. take pictures and hang out for a minute. Yeah. Wow. It's incredible. Wow. Of course, the first 40 minutes is driving across Denver, but beyond that, it's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> and so where, will, where would people stay if they came to the fair? Where could they stay? There are over 80 Airbnbs in, in the area. Um, there's also a couple of hotels in town. I, they're most likely they're booked up by now. There's also, um, you know, the town is at the end of the road and beyond our town are actually two access points to national forests. Um, so you can camp all the way up in there. I mean, there's so many campsites that you can, they can accommodate people. So RVs and tents, I mean, anyone can really come and stay for free if they wanted to. Just bring mosquito protection. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they should be down by then. You bring your own citronella, right? <laughs> and just for everybody listening, as a reminder, we're going to have links on the sustainabilitynow.global website, and the event is August 16th through the 18th, 2019, and is it right around that time every year? It if is. people don't get to make it this year, and they hear this later and want to check it out? I think we're going to start shooting for the third weekend in August consistently. 
Okay. It's going to be a good weekend for us, and we're hoping to branch out into Labor Day weekend for um, three days of hands-on workshops. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, so we'll do the event, and then a couple of weeks later, we'll invite people back to go to actual construction sites where they can work for maybe a half a day and experience what it's really like to build with tires or bales or paper creep. Beautiful. Beautiful. Maybe, maybe there's a way that you could have it be back-to-back -back so people could just be there. Mm -hmm. Like travel and stay. <laughs> yeah. That, and that's been a conversation. It just starts to be about a five or a six day. Right. But it is a stretch to get here. So that right. will make a lot of sense. Thank cool. You. So now this has been going for 30 years. That's epic. How did you, how, what's the secret of the success, do you think? The commitment of the community. Since it's always been volunteer run, it's, it's always been one leader or someone who's doing a building project. You know, one of um, Nick Chambers with uh, Living Arts Systems is coming back in this year. He's been a former director, but he, he's stepped away because he's built a methane digester and he's also has a gasifier. And so it seems like it's the people working on the technologies tend to gravitate, help the event happen, and then it just, it's a continuous flow of, of people in the community contributing their skill sets. And, but this is really, I think, the first year where we're formalizing to make this a year-round educational platform. We feel it's just with the state of the climate globally, with our just economic, economic crisis, with housing issues, uh, the justice, there's so many pieces that we, instead of having an event, now we say this is what's highlighting how we live all year. Thank and this you. has become such an amazing mm -hmm. resource for people to mm -hmm. not only learn from people who are doing it, but also to take back with them the, the tools that they need and the skill set that they need that they otherwise wouldn't be able to find in one location. Exactly. That, you know, the, for everybody listening, the thing that motivated the start of sustainability now was a vision I have for an eco park. And you guys are talking about what my vision is really, um, <laughs> you know, where you have a year round educational center and a destination where people can go and see and learn all of these different things all in one place and, and take it back into their communities and, and implement it in their lives. It's brilliant and beautiful. And I'm so grateful that we have this connection. It's very, very exciting. Thank you, Mira. I, I wanted to mention too, for people traveling that there's also couch surfing. A lot of people stay and really try to help each other with that aspect. So there's also Woofing, the Worldwide Organic Organization of Organic Farmers. We have several sites in the community where people can come and stay. So they trade their work and food for helping on that farm or at that location or building site. Well, so let's talk, we've been talking about the fair a bit. And I, I want to talk a bit about the community because it seems like we just said earlier that there's a synergy that one feeds the other feeds the other and it just sort of mushrooms and, and um, the community has existed for 30 years and that, is also an anomaly uh, and it's such an interesting and eclectic community. I mean, you said it started out with military housing, right? Or, or housing for retired military people. And now you've got over tw oh, somewhere between 20 and 30 religious organizations there. And talk about the mix of people and the challenges that you face as a community. Also, you said that it's growing. And so the prospect of it growing is also facing you with new challenges. So let's talk about that. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, Defer you know, a realtor. It's, right, I'm a realtor, by the way. So it's also- <laughs> There you go, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> you know, um, the, we, the we need to talk. A, it's interesting because at any given point in time, you can walk down the street and see a Buddhist monk hanging out with a, you know, a Catholic priest for lunch. You know, that's, that in itself is very unique. But you also have, you know, to be here and to really um, exist here in a way that's meaningful and that's 
fulfilling, you know, it's, there are challenges living on the high desert. I mean, you know, we're 88,000 feet up in the air and we're, you know, 88,000, 88, okay, <laughs> you know, and there's also, you know, we're, we're in a high desert. So the, the, the atmosphere is a little thin, you know, we also don't get much rain. So it's, it, there are a variety of challenges that present itself. So the people that want to be here uh, or that are here want to have to want to be here, you know. Um, you know, the hospital is about an hour away. Um, of, uh, there isn't a stoplight for an hour as well near us, nor uh, a fast food restaurant. So, you know, the, the type of living here is very specific and very unique in the American culture. Um, so, you know, I think that um, you have a lot of people who are here very independent, who are very, um, who are very gung-ho about doing and sustaining themselves in a way that is, again, unique in this, in this, uh, in this country. Um, and that allows them, and you know, they mingle with people like that. So you have a lot of very headstrong, opinionated people who live here. And so, you know, doing this, this event every year can be a bit of a challenge, getting all <laughs> these different types of people to work together, but it, it, does, it does work out in the end and it really comes out in a beautiful way. Wow, neat. And, and for um, Lisa and Donovan, do you have some input into that? Like what kind of dynamics do you recognize as challenges in the community and what kinds of steps have you taken to be able to um, address those challenges effectively? Well, you know, when I can speak from my own experience, when I moved here, I was able to house it for someone that was on solar which I had never been on. I, I was never, I grew up in the Midwest, so I had never been exposed to even solar panels and that technology. So it was learning that system. But then my thought went, what if I need help? Where do I go? Who do I call? And that led to volunteering with our local fire department and search and rescue. And so what, what I see how we're moving forward with new people, it's looking what are the existing systems and structures that, it, that really need more support because those people are giving a big energetic exchange. Um, they're, you know, they're really serving in that time when you need it the most. And in a rural community that typically isn't paid, that's also volunteer service or very small for being on call. Um, we really need to support those types of services that are at the end of the road. So that's, um, been one of the places where I see we can really come together because it's something that everyone relates to. Everyone's had to call the, you know, call our sheriff or call the ambulance or call the fire department or has someone in their family that has. So it creates another unit of family. So they're always looking for good people and volunteers as well. Um, mm -hmm. And you said there's no fast food. Um, do you have a co-op there? I mean, what kind of groceries do you have? Do people grow food and, and have a farmer's market? What, what's it like? How do, you, how do you navigate those basics? Well, there's a couple of grocery stores. I mean, there's an there's a, um, organic grocery store as well as a, re a traditional grocery store. And so that's, there's never a dearth of, you know, things to find to eat. <laughs> okay, so it's not, it's not really like um, farmer's market kind of uh, collective. On Saturdays, we have a we have a market, and okay. people grow. You know, there are actually quite a few people who have greenhouses here, um, so you have a, a variety of people who bring you know all kinds of things for um, you know to eat and also to grow themselves. Okay, and and is the market like a traditional market, or do you find that like it's more progressive? It's more um, you know bulk foods that people can bring their own containers and you know conscientious yeah, or it's it's more boutique. You know, I think maybe 20% of the people who come are, um, have food to, to give and to, and to sell. The remainder of them are a lot of, um, you know, you'll have um, uh, Chris, people who are selling crystals and, and uh, woven crystals. You'll have people who um, are, you know, selling different psychic readings and things like that. It's very, it's very in, in, indicative of the town people who live here. <laughs> awesome. So Donovan, what's your input as far as the collective community? and challenges and, and methods that you guys have implemented to overcome those challenges? So I've been helping with the fair for, like I said, about seven years. And a few years ago, Lisa got involved. Um, and I'm finding Lisa to be probably our primary component to that shift uh, because of her background. And so the way that I, I guess the way my mind perceives it, 
because this is a mining community. When you extract the minerals out of the earth, they're not exclusive, right? So when you're mining gold, you don't find necessarily just gold. You find gold that's attached to a bunch of other minerals. And so the way that my mind perceives it is, unfortunately, when you have so much diversity within a community, it's easy when you have what you might consider a foundational value disagreement with someone to discount that person's other attributes. Yeah. And I find that to be a similar thing to taking that large chunk of minerals and discounting the gold that's in it because of the other minerals that might be there. You're not going to brilliant find, analogy. Just yeah, love so it. That's kind of where we're at. And Lisa really drives that home um, in making sure that we acknowledge that bit of gold that's in every conglomerate rock. I gotcha. I, I think part of- She's amazing. She's too, amazing. <laughs> part of, I think what's happening too is, you know, with that spiritual element, even if you have people that don't follow or aren't practicing on a certain path, they are here at the end of the road and you're very close to the elements. So I feel like the elements have a play in this and it's really, what we have in common. I listened to Phil Lane last night, so thank you for that suggestion. And he talked about the, the, the mother and the earth and that heartbeat and that we all have that in common. We all have the sun in common. You know? And so when we start to take the basics of the natural environment around us, we can start to build a platform and, and, and really start to work together because Right now, I think, I feel like we're in a, it's like a little jumble turn <laughs> and it, it's seeing where does everybody fall out? Like, what are our skill sets? What are our resources? Where do we, where do we thrive? You know, cause oftentimes we're in our structures and our schools, we're brought in a whole different system. There's a lot of competitiveness. Um, there's a lot of, we're, we've brought restorative justice into our schools. So I feel like that's, another place where we're addressing those challenges. If we start with the youth and they're starting to learn how to resolve conflict, they're going to be the ones teaching us how to do it in the community. Yeah. Yeah. Which actually brings up a great point. How much influence do you have on the school curriculum? How much do I personally? Yeah, well, you're just, how, how much does the community shape the curriculum in the school versus the state kind of well, mandate? We have two schools, so one is a traditional public school, K-12, to and one is a charter school, K-12. to So I would say the charter probably has a little bit more influence in their, their curriculum. They have their own governing board and um, really encourage a lot of parent involvement, community involvement. And because we don't have a community center in our um, where we live, the school often becomes that hub or the schools become the hubs of activity and other events. So there's definitely a lot of dialogue and a lot of sharing. But as far as the energy fair platform, it's something we're, we're looking at. I think um, the, the school has a really good mentorship program where the students get to select their mentors in the community. Mm -hmm. And so if they want to do, you know, woodworking or if they want to learn to play the piano or so whatever those other skills that aren't taught in a traditional school setting they'll bust the kids to those mentors on a weekly basis wow skill set so we do have a huge opportunity to network the youth with all the, the the builders and the gardeners and those aspects have you guys considered getting this formalized into some kind of program that you can get accredited we are moving so fast. We are just trying to keep up. Because, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it sounds like you're going to be creating this year-round resource center where people are able to learn how to do this. There's no reason that, I mean, like in my world, ideally, our educational system would be teaching the kinds of things that you guys are teaching in your community and sharing throughout the community because those are all skills that our new world is going to require of us. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so like you're creating kind of a new paradigm there too. We um, also have a, a good following with intentional communities. Um, yeah. you know, and I think that's it because Crestone really embodies a lot of those um, 
those unique attributes that those type of communities have. You know, With much greater success than many of those communities <laughs> have been able to uh, muster. Exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah, you're kind of a flagship as far as I can tell. Yeah. Which is pretty impressive. Yeah, there's, we're, like Lisa said, though, with all of the diversity, we definitely are experiencing all of the same challenges that those mm -hmm. guys are experiencing. It's the interpersonal, it's the interpersonal. It's, mm -hmm. we've forgotten how to disagree and still get along. Right. And it's unfortunate right. because we've got to be able to have differing opinions and different points of view, yet still find the gold in those conversations and those attributes. Well, the truth is that if it's handled properly, that, that um, friction creates growth. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you know, it's like you don't want everybody having the same thought and the same idea because oh. then there's no growth or transformation, right? Exactly. How boring would that be? Right. And, and there wouldn't be, there would be no innovation, right? If everybody thought the same way, there would be no innovation. So, yeah, so we all have something unique to bring, and it's a matter of finding, like you said, mining the gold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and collectively being able to, um, to use it to, or shape new things from that gold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's awesome. So <clears throat> you said that um, Crestone is facing quite a lot of growth, and as it's growing, as more people are becoming aware of it, you have new challenges that you're being faced with, one of which is energy and another is of waste, particularly, I think you said. Um, and I'm wondering how, how that is being navigated. Boy, can you break that down? <laughs> well, so how, do you, how does a community like Crestone handle an influx of all these new people and the and the the me challenge mechanical challenges of having a functional community can i say we're working on that oh please in my opinion that's where we are we're in that place where like nick said this has been a, a relatively hidden place at 15 miles down a dead end road you really had to find out about it from somewhere to get here mm -hmm. So now that the word is starting to get out and people are starting to flock here, mm -hmm. it is what we're striving to start evaluating. How do we make that transition? As those people are coming in, how do we educate them about where they're coming to? Right, like, okay, so do you have like a, a town uh, council that it creates any kind of orientation program for new people yeah, moving? There's, there's, a, there, there's a creative district that actually does publish, uh, you know, a, a tourism map that, a lot, that you know, I, I on a regular basis give out um, to newcomers, you know, because we, we see, especially lately, um, once or twice a week, people are drawn here for whatever reason, and a lot of times they don't even know why. And they're starry-eyed and are want to learn more about you know the area and the religious organizations here, and you know they end up in my office <laughs> asking questions. Um, so we have we do have a, um, a creative council who helps at least for at the beginning of their um, stay here, it kind of gives some input on the general history of the area and stuff like that. But uh, you know, as far as assimilating them into the community, Lisa mentioned that you know the the. The mountains, there's a saying here that the mountains will either keep you or spit you out. And it's true. It's like, you know, if people resonate with what we're doing here, they will stay. But, you know, it doesn't matter how, how starry-eyed or how much property they buy, within a year, if they're not meant to be here, something takes them out. It's really that's, interesting to see. Well, that's, how, that's what I observe with any vortex area. <laughs> you know, like Taos, New Mexico, Hawaii, you know, same thing. It's it's got a very specific frequency and you make it, you're, you, you're supposed to be there or you're not. Part of the complexity is, you know, we do have a town council with the town of Creston, but that's only for the 150 people that live in the town proper. Oh. And then the rest of the residents are in what's called a property owners association. So it's still a private organization run by a corporation. 
And so we've been looking at different ways that, um, you know, we've looked at how do we combine the two, how do we share resources, and that's been a very long-term conversation happening in this community. Yeah. It's a complex program that we're not, with our platform, ready to probably lead on lead, be yeah. the lead on that because you have these two different agencies that are the um the governing agents and so for city planning and stuff like that i mean i i would imagine that you had all these isolated people that were developing their own thing kind of in proximity to one another and now as it's building there's like a greater need for services like um sewage treatment or something like that or or you know some kind of uh, um, maybe even more developed grid system or microgrids or you know some kind of policy that is governing how people are going to continue to develop. So you were talking about people putting up like McMansions or these little you know like tract homes or whatever. What 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 do you envision? If you could make it up in an ideal situation, what kind of transition do you imagine would be optimal? Well, I think a good step in the right direction is, um, is a checklist that, that Donovan has, has mm -hmm. developed for a long time. It's a sustainability uh, building checklist. And it's actually on our website. And it really kind of guides builders and you know, both owner builders and, and potential you know, hired builders to build in a way that is mindful of the sustainability practices that the community really um, appreciates. You know, I think that's, that's a really amazing step in the right direction for, for the community and for people who are potentially coming here. So the thing is that right now it's not legislated. Right now it's kind of by agreement and by um, sort of a tacit but collective agreement. Well, like, there's, no, there's no building codes here. So, you know, as long as the house or structure is over 900 square feet, they can build whatever they want. <laughs> that's very interesting. Okay. And the tracts of land, do they have any kind of specific area that a minimum, like a quarter acre or anything like that? In the neighborhoods, it's a, it's the smallest is about a half acre. Um, uh, oh, wow. Well. And then when you, as you go into the valley, it gets larger. I mean, you have some tracts of land that are 20, 30 acres. So, okay. Um, yeah. Beautiful. So I'm wondering, is there Besides reminding people that they definitely want to check into the at the website and we'll have the link on our site to learn about the Crestone Energy Fair, um, uh, which is August 16th through the 18th of 2019 and probably the third weekend of August from here on in. Uh, besides that, is there anything I should have asked you that I didn't ask? I just had a last thought on your other question is, I think with all of these new, with, with, with growth anywhere, it's how do we get out of that mentality that it's not an us versus them? You know, for instance, with our local SLV, REC, our electric co-op, the members are really looking at solutions for this new rate structure because they realize things are changing and Colorado's growing pretty quick. So instead of, you know, where you go into that board meeting and it's the, people against the agency it's like how do we look at these we have the intelligence here we have the wisdom how do we come together to create solutions and that not one side always has the answer and then getting away from that duality of right and wrong it's like let's come and that to that is the perfect foundational perspective for what we're all facing as we're moving forward on this planet we need to build those bridges to find ways to make everything, make things be a win-win across the board. And that that's more important than anything because without that, nothing is going to be sustainable, <laughs> right? Yeah. So like once we realize that we're actually all on the same side, mm -hmm. you know, then we can do something, right? So, I, I want to ask any resources that you guys would want to offer besides the website, like any books that you found really inspiring, any, uh, any uh, websites or other resources that have been life altering for you that you want to share? 
Um, our, our Earthship books from um, Earthship Biotechure definitely changed my world. And if someone really wants to catch an insight into Michael Reynolds, who is the developer of that concept, um, find his book called The Coming of Wizards. Oh, wow. What a great title. And that will definitely give you some, some background on how that all came to be. And it's a brilliant piece of work. Oh, love it. Thank you so much. I haven't heard of that book. Anybody else? Um, I was re really introduced to Charles Eisenstein's work this winter. So listen to the audio book. And then Donovan just uh, let me know that he has a podcast going as well. So I'm just starting to, but really looking at the sacredness of, of economics, of our structures, of how we're working in community. So I really like his work. Yes. And uh, so um, his book is, one of his books is called Sacred Economics. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it kind of turned my world upside down. And it was so interesting. I had such a cognitive dissonance <laughs> you know initially it was like what I you know I just I couldn't I couldn't get it I it just was such a different uh perspective and I and and very challenging and he's a scholarly writer mm -hmm. at least I I thought so because I'm not an economics person yeah. so I I found it very very stimulating and transformative really profound so that's a great recommendation thank you for that anybody else nick you know what motivates me is that um I'll, i've done in a significant amount of research over the years in you know the, the earth changes that are currently upon us and the way that we are going to have to move into sustainable living in order to really survive them yeah. um, and so that's that you know i i can't quote a book off the top of my head for that. But um, I can tell you that, you know, there's, there's so much research out there now showing, you know, how, how these changes are going to affect each of our climate systems, you know, in different ways. You know, here in the San Luis Valley, it potentially we're going to get more rain, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, but it can also be, also mean pretty substantial temperatures that we have not seen ever in the past. So, you know, it's, it's all about learning how we're going to adapt to those scenarios and, um, and learning how to, you know, live within an environment that we can, you know, grow and sustain ourselves um, independently. Exactly, exactly. So this is where the importance of microgrids comes in. And um, it was really interesting. Amy and Amzi from uh, East Coast Earth Homes is what they've called themselves. Um, are talking about Earthship 2.0, and they're talking about the paradigm of a building that supports us instead of us having to pay for the utilities and pay for the heat and pay for the cooling and pay for the water. How about a building that is its own sustaining uh, biosphere, you know? And and that that should be the norm. Of course, that's how it should be. And um, I think what you're talking about is the the necessity that we're going to be facing for that. Actually, yep. so why not embrace it now, right? While well, we have the opportunity to do it out of choice rather than necessity, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for being here. This has been such a delight. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you yeah. Mira. Thank you for everything that you're doing online as well with the summit and bringing everyone together and inspiring conversations. Like you mentioned, it's the same thing that we're striving to do here locally amongst our own diverse culture and inviting in people from the outside to also stimulate us. Mm -hmm. um, it's critical that we start finding these ways to move forward and let yes. go of the past that we already know isn't functioning for us. Yes. Yes, and, and there's so many people that are engaged in these kinds of uh, ventures and adventures uh, that what we really need to do is to connect everybody. We need to be talking to each other and brainstorming together. And, you know, if people have been developing in all these little individual pockets. And if we can just connect them, we've got a network that's going to go around the world and, and we can see exponential change. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, well, okay. Well, that's it for today. I'm <laughs> your host, <laughs> Mira Rubin. And until next time, live your best life, love the world around you, and together we can 
save the world. Thank you for listening to Sustainability Now, solutions to shape a world that works. Visit sustainabilitynow.global for resources related to today's program. And be sure to subscribe, share, and follow us on social media.